Good morning, everyone. We've still got about one or two minutes before we actually start. So um, uh, just be patient with us here and we'll get started in a minute. Let a few more people log in. Is that an official 50th anniversary PDB mug you have, Chuck? You know, I was just thinking how incorrect it is that the president of the Protein Society is drinking out of his Biophysical Society oh. mug. <laughs> no, we're, we're friends. The, yeah, my joke is, is it's the peptide of the Protein Society that are always, you know, competing for supremacy. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. We're kind of like the little sister of uh, the Biophysical Society, kind of mutual affection, so. So, well, I think it's 11, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So, um, so uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, I'm Chuck Sanders. I'm the president of the Protein Society, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Protein Society webinar, COVID-19, a science-based approach. And this is actually the second edition of this webinar. Uh, our organizer, Michael Kay, organized one of these a year ago, which inaugurated our first series of webinars. This is the beginning of our second series of webinars. There will be more this year. And so I wanna thank Michael for again, organizing this and thank the speakers for their participation. We know that especially on this topic, uh, all of you are in great demand. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just update everybody on a couple of Protein Society uh, news items. Um, so uh, first, re regarding our journal Protein Science, um, after a, a very long and influential and important uh, service, Brian Matthews is in the process of stepping down as the editor of the journal. And John Curian is the new editor uh, who started on, on, on November 15th and everything is going very well. And we hope that you'll uh, continue to support uh, Protein Science, the journal. Um, I also want to point out, uh, just remind everyone that the 36th Annual Protein Society uh, Annual Symposium is next summer, July 7th through 10th in San Francisco. Hopefully, uh, COVID conditions will be such that we can all travel there uh, with reckless abandon and have a, a wonderful meeting there. We have a wonderful program scheduled. And so with that, I'd like to turn uh, uh, the chairmanship, chairpersonship over to Michael Kay. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Kay from the University of Utah Department of Biochemistry. And it's my pleasure to host uh, this, our part two of a COVID webinar series from the Protein Society. So uh, I'm just gonna open up with a few introductory remarks before we get to the really exciting science uh, of our four speakers. So I'm just gonna pull up my slides. All right, is that clear for people? Is the panelists give me a thumbs up? Yep, great. So uh, again, welcome. Um, and so uh, I just wanna start off with this uh, beautiful overview figure uh, that came from Anne Liu from uh, Janet Awas's lab who runs the animation lab at the University of Utah. And just to give a plug for this wonderful uh, lab and website, uh, which is shown here, uh, which has a beautiful animation of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, full life cycle. So I really encourage you to check that out uh, if you haven't seen some of Dr. Awasa's uh, amazing animations like of the full HIV life cycle and other uh, complex structure-based uh, complex processes. So uh, do check that out. And so I thought this just served as a really nice title slide. So diving in, uh, as Chuck mentioned, we were here uh, a little more than a year ago uh, in June uh, last year uh, for the first of the Protein Society webinars. And at that time, uh, this is what the COVID picture looked like. 
Um, it was looking uh, not so great, but uh, things had really leveled off with all of the lockdowns and various measures that were putting in place. And the theme there was really trying to contain uh, things long enough for an effective vaccine to become available, which of course did happen uh, about six months uh, afterwards. At this point, uh, there were more than 6 million cases worldwide and almost 400,000 deaths. And uh, unfortunately, we, I think, would not have predicted back then uh, that we would be still uh, talking about COVID and that it was uh, actually significantly worse uh, a year and a half later. Uh, these are some recent stats uh, from the New York Times uh, webpage. And you can see it's been a roller coaster ride of various waves of different seasons. And unfortunately, we're in another wave right now uh, with increasing incidents uh, worldwide. And now the death toll has exceeded uh, 5 million people worldwide uh, with uh, over 267 million uh, cases. So uh, this has really been an enduring pandemic and the end is not uh, readily in sight uh, as we may have hoped uh, back in our previous uh, webinar. But of course there's hope and there's been tremendous progress. And uh, just picking one slide, uh, this is a worldwide vaccination data slide. Uh, from uh, our world in data. Uh, and uh, this is really a, a pretty staggering achievement uh, that uh, less than a year uh, after the first wave of vaccines were approved, that more than half of the world population has now received at least one vaccine dose and nearly half has been fully vaccinated. And so I think this is something that is really an incredible achievement in terms of speed and impact, uh, but it also emphasizes the half of the world that doesn't have access to the vaccine yet and the many challenges that have arisen with uh, distribution, with vaccine hesitancy and uh, you know, unequal access around the world that are remaining challenges going forward. Uh, but it is really a staggering achievement uh, that uh, basically a year after uh, identifying um, a vaccine that uh, it already is reaching, you know, half of the world. And then for us as researchers, I was really impressed by this graphic, which I think nicely summarizes the magnitude and the response of the research community. Uh, this came from uh, the Lancet Planetary Health. Um, this is a plot of preprints that have been on the main preprint servers like BioArchive and MedArchive, um, and how they uh, have grown from when the uh, a particular pandemic or you know new outbreak was reported, and you can see uh, this uh, orange curve here is SARS-CoV-2, the incredibly fast and incredibly intense response. This is a log scale, um, and so the research community has responded uh, extremely fast, extremely vigorously. It's really unprecedented compared to even other recent serious infectious outbreaks. And so uh, this has been incredibly exciting with all the new information that's coming available, but also extremely challenging uh, for the community to process all of this data and to understand what it means for going forward. So uh, this is a figure that I showed uh, during the last webinar, but it's been updated that just helps to put the COVID pandemic in context of major worldwide pandemics. So COVID is down here. Uh, and you can see uh, over the uh, centuries, uh, some of the other major pandemics, uh, that COVID is really um, unprecedented in modern times, uh, except for uh, HIV uh, AIDS, which is shown here, and then going back a little further, uh, the Spanish flu. Uh, but you can see that uh, given especially how much the world population has grown, that this really is uh, you know, not as bad as some of these other ones have been in the past and that uh, you know, things could really be a lot worse than they are with COVID-19. And so it's really critically important for us to absorb the lessons of this pandemic so that we're prepared for a future uh, more lethal uh, spread um, such that we don't have a repeat of some of these historic uh, pandemics and their devastating effects on death in the population. So just to briefly summarize a few lessons that I think that have already become very apparent uh, looking at COVID uh, in terms of the research community. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, it's really obvious to all of us and now becoming more obvious to the public that there's been an incredible payoff of investments in basic research. And if you just look at the impact of things like uh, cryo-EM and the investment in cryo-EM facilities, uh, next generation sequencing, mRNA vaccine technology, these are all things that weren't invented for COVID, uh, of course, uh, but were uh, you know, supported for many years before that and were able to spring into action uh, when COVID arose, allowing us to have an unprecedented response. And so I think this is really a great example of, of these investments paying off and something that we wanna you know, emphasize to the public. 
The need for worldwide cooperation has, of course, been uh, huge in COVID, uh, both in terms of surveillance and also in terms of disseminating information, uh, manufacturing capabilities. Uh, key breakthroughs have come from all over the world. This has definitely not been a US dominated uh, response. Uh, the value of rapid dissemination, I think, has really become apparent. This is now the age of the preprint server. And as I was showing before, the ability to share data in almost real time and not wait several months for peer review has been incredibly valuable. Um, but of course, it brings challenges of how do we process all that information? How do we evaluate it? Um, and how do we deal with information that seems promising at first, but then gets uh, attenuated by further analysis? I think it's really been critical, the need for multiple approaches. Uh, this has definitely not been a winner take all um, pandemic in terms of uh, various interventions. I think we all now really appreciate the value of vaccines and different types of vaccines that each have different benefits in terms of cost or distribution and storage, effectiveness, um, but also therapeutics. Um, there's not just the need for a single therapeutic. Again, uh, the need for multiple approaches because it's so difficult to know which ones will have impact and having a portfolio of options is incredibly important, especially like for right now where an Omicron is arising, uh, you know, having different approaches that will have different sensitivities to resistance and different possibilities of being applied. And so that whole portfolio approach is really critically important. Uh, and then finally, I think it's been obvious that uh, a pandemic like this just can't respond on individual responses of individual companies. And so the combined resources of industry uh, and a coordinated government response has really been critical for getting especially the vaccines out uh, so quickly and distributed. And I think it's been a great model uh, going forward for how to deal with these types of emergencies. So uh, some other uh, things that I think are really worth talking about, uh, this has been a rare opportunity to actually watch how research is done in real time and the public is really engaged with it in a way that just hasn't been true before. So if you will, we are making the sausage uh, of uh, COVID research and the public is getting a chance to watch. Uh, and so Jerry here is watching uh, the, the research happening. And I think this creates some uh, really great opportunities for us to explain a lot about how the research enterprise works how do we work as a community and to uh, make sure the public understands why this is worthy uh, of their support. Um, and so I think it's been a great opportunity to explain, you know, why research takes as long as it does and why it costs what it does, um, how that even in an emergency, uh, the field has a, a commitment to safety and rigor that cannot be thrown aside. And so for instance, explaining why a clinical trial is happening faster than usual, uh, it's really critical to explain that it's a matter of conserving resources where normally things are done stepwise, but when you have an emergency, you can basically, basically waste some resources potentially on things that may not work, but not uh, wasting uh, or not uh, losing the commitment to safety and rigor uh, in the results. And I think this is really critical for building confidence, especially when things move fast. There's a lot of early model studies, especially in preprints, that get a lot of publicity, and these often give misleading results. Uh, this has been especially true with small molecule uh, candidates, things like uh, chloroquine or ivermectin. And so I think it's really important to educate people uh, how uh, this uh, you know, data that comes out early is not necessarily something that you should jump and change your life based on. It's part of a, uh, a series of things that eventually build to action, but you, know, you can't jump at every preliminary result. I think it's important for people to see that process play out in public and how research is self-correcting. And so it doesn't always get things right, especially with preliminary early studies, uh, but the, the process is inherently self-correcting and people are always testing those early conclusions to see how solid they are and whether they hold up. And that this is a good thing, that people shouldn't apologize for having a change in their conclusion or point of view when new data becomes available and the picture becomes clear. This is a good thing and that we should actually be proud of. And of course, uh, physicians do this all the time, but as a community and in public health, we have to really get comfortable making important decisions with incomplete data and then revising those decisions as new data becomes available. And again, being as transparent as possible about that process to again, build confidence uh, in the process rather than to uh, you know, pretend that uh, there's just perfect decisions and that they cannot be changed. And then finally, uh, this is just a great opportunity uh, for us to always emphasize what a great career research is and uh, how satisfying it is to be part of this worldwide effort to respond to pandemic emergencies, but also just the day-to-day -day research uh, where we all contribute in different ways uh, towards improving uh, human welfare. And that this is a career that needs people and needs talent and to really use this as an inspiring moment to uh, inspire the next generation of research talent. So with that, uh, 
that's just my, my preamble. Um, I would love to get to the science. We have four wonderful speakers here who are talking about very diverse aspects uh, of uh, COVID research. And so I'd like to get right to it. Uh, and so I'll stop sharing my slides. And then uh, let's see, Neil, if you wanna share yours and then I'll just very briefly introduce you. Absolutely. And can you just let me know, are you able to see the slides? Yes, so I can see the slides, so great. Okay, so uh, I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Neil King. Uh, Neil is an assistant professor of biochemistry uh, and member of the Institute of Protein Design at the University of Washington. Uh, and so Neil has really been at the forefront of computational design, uh, especially in the context of uh, vaccination. So uh, welcome, Neil. Thank you very much again for doing this. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here um, and discuss this important topic. All right, so let's jump right into it. So, so I'm gonna be giving really kind of a technology focused talk on computationally designing nanoparticle vaccines and how we've applied um, this technology uh, in response to the pandemic. So I think it goes without saying, and, and, and Michael was touching on this, but we're in the midst of a technology driven revolution in vaccine design, right? So if you think about just the, the ingenuity and the technology that's being applied to this problem, it's, it's staggering. Um, so, you know, a few things, uh, structure-based antigen design and antigen engineering, and kind of the poster child for this before the pandemic was pre-fusion uh, RSVF. Um, of course, similar techniques uh, have been applied to stabilize uh, the spike protein that, that's in many of the currently used vaccines. Obviously, novel vaccine delivery technologies like mRNA vaccines, which have been a long time coming, a uh, huge amount of, of basic research went into that. And as Michael mentioned, that uh, became very valuable um, in response to the pandemic. And then kind of a, a perhaps even more cutting edge example, this concept of germline targeting, where you engineer antigens to interact with specific naive B cells in, in vaccinated subjects and shepherd the immune response towards an antibody that can provide broad protection. And the amount of technology that's gone into this approach is, is incredible. So one other technology that's contributing to next generation vaccine design is the design of self-assembling or particulate immunogens. And it's been known forever from studies of, of naturally occurring pathogens that particulate immunogens enhance the immune response in several different ways. So one mechanism by which the, the immune system detects uh, danger detects pathogens is through repetition of antigenic determinants. So B cell receptors on the surface of B cells are clustered in response to three-dimensional repetition of, of antigen that drives stronger signaling in the B cell and leads to a more potent humoral response, a better antibody response. But it's not only B cell receptor clustering, the interactions of particular immunogens with the innate immune system, as well as their trafficking and localization in vivo um, all contributes to this enhanced response. And again, is tapping into the evolution of the immune system against pathogens that are themselves little particles. So today I'm gonna to be talking about self-assembling protein vaccines. And of course, this is a clinically validated vaccine modality. The HPV and HBV vaccines are both self-assembling proteins. Um, these are virus-like particles so they naturally self-assemble as, as part of the virus. Um, and these are some of the safest and most effective subunit vaccines, purified protein vaccines that we have. However, if your antigen that you're interested in, interested in doesn't naturally self-assemble like a VLP, what you need is a scaffold, a self-assembling scaffold to which th that you can use to display your antigen. So this is beautiful work out of the, the NIH's Vaccine Research Center a few years ago showing that non-viral structural proteins like ferritin can be used as scaffolds to display complex antigens, oligomeric, glycosylated, disulfide bonded proteins, for example. And one of the reasons you might wanna use proteins as a, as a scaffold is because, is, is several fold, but one of the reasons is you can seamlessly integrate the antigen into your display platform through genetic fusion, 
All of this is genetically encoded, so these could potentially be delivered via an mRNA or an, uh, uh, a viral vector. And because these are proteins, if you do it right, they should fold and assemble to a single native state. So every particle looks just like every other. And you can see that in these electron micrographs. So in this work, they were displaying influenza hemagglutinin and showed that the nanoparticle vaccines elicited much stronger antibody responses than the uh, inactivated commercial vaccines at the time. So this is that increased potency that you get from multivalent display. So that work stimulated a huge number of studies using non-viral structural proteins as scaffolds. This is only a small sampling of that work. Clearly this approach is successful. However, the vast majority of studies in this area have used one of these three scaffolds, ferritin, encapsulin, or limousine synthase. So while this can be successful, these scaffolds can also fail, and they're also fixed in their structural properties. Ferritin is ferritin, and it's always going to be ferritin. You can't do anything to fundamentally change its structural properties. So one of the things that we do and one of our guiding principles at the Institute for Protein Design is that we wanna create protein-based technologies that are simple, robust, and controllable. And this cartoon kind of, you know, it's a silly depiction of if you wanted to, to make a new technology, let's say an alarm clock, and you limited yourself to only using things that already existed around your house, you might come up with this ridiculous non-robust contraption. But this is not how humans invent technologies. We design and build pieces to make the thing that we need. And when you do this, you end up with technologies that are simple, robust, and controllable. So can we do this with proteins? So in the nano, nanoparticle vaccine space, <clears throat> the first step here um, was developing a general computational method for designing new self-assembling proteins. And so this is a graphical depiction of that design method. It comprises two fundamental steps, a docking step, where we figure out how oligomeric protein building blocks fit together in three dimensions to make some sort of regular architecture. And then we do amino acid sequence design, in this case, protein-protein interface design, to come up with a new amino acid sequence that should be low in energy, and if it is, should drive assembly specifically to the target structure. So at the end of the day, what you get out of, out of the software um, is a hypothesis in two parts, a pair of amino acid sequences and a three-dimensional structure. You predict those sequences will form. So we take those hypotheses into the lab and test them. And this is a series of eight nanoparticles that, that Jacob Bale, a very talented graduate student I worked with in the Baker Lab, designed a few years ago. These are icosahedral nanoparticles, 120 subunits. So they're about the size of the smallest viruses, like an AAV. And you can see from the micrographs, again, that every particle looks just like every other. They're very regular and monodisperse. When you average the particles, you get images that closely resemble projections calculated from what we made up in the computer. So these things were designed to form uh, a specific structure and they do in fact form that structure. And when we solve crystal structures of these, we tend to find that they have been designed with atomic level accuracy. So in both of these cases, the root mean squared deviation over all 120 subunits in the assembly is 0.6 angstroms, so about half the width of an oxygen atom. And the implication of this, of course, is that it enables the design of new nanomaterials with customized structures. So if you want a nanoparticle that's more porous, you might go for the architecture on the left. If you want one that's less porous, you might go for the architecture on the right. And so now this ability gives us the opportunity to test specific structural features and generate systematic series of immunogens that we can use to interrogate the immune response and figure out what the ideal vaccine looks like. So my group has been doing a lot of work in, in this space over the last few years with a huge number of collaborators worldwide. And we've really convinced ourselves that these two component nanoparticles that are assembled from two different designed proteins are really a robust and versatile platform for multivalent display. And so this is just a, a, an incomplete list of the, the variety of antigens that, that we've put on these sorts of scaffolds. So today I wanna, I wanna focus on SARS-CoV-2 obviously, but also bring in a little bit of data from work we've done in influenza. Um, and these are two slightly different stories that, that dovetail in the end on how we're using, designing and using these nanoparticle vaccines. Um, all of this work was in collaboration with David Wiesler's group here at UW, as well as Masaru Kaneki and Barney Graham 
at the, the VRC. So <clears throat> in response to the pandemic last year, um, we made a series of nanoparticle immunogens displaying either the entire prefusion stabilized spike ectodomain or just the receptor binding domain. We actually got the best data from the particles displaying just the receptor binding domain. So that's what we moved forward. So Lexi Walls in, in the Wiesler group and Brooke Fiala in my lab uh, designed this nanoparticle that displays 60 copies of the SARS-CoV-2 RBD in a highly dense array. The way we make these things is by producing these two proteins separately and then assembling them in vitro. And the advantage of that is that, you know, these are just two standard recombinant biologics. You control the assembly process in vitro, and that is, is really advantageous during manufacturing and has greatly simplified the manufacture of this particle at scale. The particles, again, are, are very monodispersed. Light scattering data, negative stain electron uh, micrographs show, again, that every particle looks just like every other. These particles are also really quite stable. Um, so we found, and Priyam Vada's group also found early on in the pandemic, that the, the original prefusion stabilized spike showed a, a, a marked destabilization at, at refrigeration temperatures. Um, and, and so we saw that, uh, but we found that our particles were stable at a variety of temperatures out to a month. And of course, longer term shelf life stability studies are ongoing now. The key result, of course, though, is, is what is their immunogenicity? And so we conducted a series of mouse studies and found that the particles elicited much higher levels of neutralizing antibodies than the prefusion stabilized S2P trimer uh, that forms the basis of most currently used vaccines. So we tested low dose and high dose and found that either dose of the nanoparticle elicits very high levels of neutralizing antibodies, you know, more than an order of magnitude uh, above a panel of, of human convalescent serum samples that we had access to through Helen Chu here in Seattle. Uh, the monomeric RBD on its own was essentially invisible. We were unable to detect neutralizing uh, responses even after two immunizations. But again, you put that, that antigen on a, on a nanoparticle and display it repetitively and you get these very potent responses. Um, Ralph Baird's group at the University of North Carolina, and this is work led by Alex Schaefer over there, studied um, protection offered by the nanoparticle vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 challenge. And we found that viral replication was completely prevented in the lungs uh, and nasal turbinates, whereas we saw breakthrough with a low dose of the spike trimer. So, you know, one potential concern about an RBD-based vaccine is you might, you're not presenting all of the epitopes in the spike that might lead to protection. But we did want to ask, are we eliciting antibodies that target more than one site? So Lexi set up a competition BLI assay to, to answer this. And we found that the vaccine does elicit potent antibody responses against multiple distinct non-overlapping epitopes that are targeted by neutralizing antibodies. And we think this will help minimize the chance of viral escape. So, <clears throat> you know, the strength of the early preclinical data uh, led to a non-human primate study conducted by Prabhu Arunachalam and Bali Palindran's group uh, with a large number of collaborators that basically confirmed what we saw in mice. You get these very potent neutralizing responses uh, from the nanoparticle vaccine with a range of clinically relevant adjuvants. And so this work and, and others um, push the vaccine into clinical trials. It's currently in, in phase one, two, and phase three clinical trials uh, with two different groups, SK Bioscience um, and our spin-out company, Icosavax. And this is some data from, from SK's combined phase one, two trial, confirming what we saw in the preclinical models that the nanoparticle vaccine elicits much more potent antibody responses than the, in this case, the NIBC panel of, of standard uh, human convalescent sera. So, so far, the vaccine appears to be safe and potent in humans. And so, you know, as Michael mentioned earlier, the mRNA vaccines are, are miraculous and, and wonderful, and the speed with which they responded to the pandemic uh, was really necessary for, and, and for saving lives. But, you know, almost half of the world remains unvaccinated, um, and getting mRNA vaccines distributed worldwide has proven to be a challenge. The scalability, stability, and potency of this nanoparticle vaccine could help uh, get the rest of the world immunized. And so, you know, as long as everything continues to go well in the phase three, um, that may happen 
relatively soon. So of course, you know, the question that on everyone's mind now is, is what next, right? With all the variants coming out and three uh, coronavirus uh, crossovers to humans in the last two decades, what about the next pandemic, right? And so one way to prepare for that is through the design of broadly protective vaccines. And so one approach that we're taking to this builds on work again out of the BRC from Masaru Kanakio, who published in 2019 a new approach where you co-display multiple related but antigenically distinct antigens on protein nanoparticle scaffolds as a way to try to elicit uh, antibodies that, that can provide broad protection. In this study, they, they used ferritin and compared multiple different immunization strategies, you know, sequential immunization or heterologous prime boost, compared to a mixture of particles, each displaying a single antigen, and found that these nanoparticles that they called mosaic nanoparticles actually elicited broader neutralizing activity against five different H1N1 viruses than the other methods. However, using this, this homomeric nanoparticle ferritin uh, limited them to the display of monomeric antigens as opposed to oligomeric. And so <clears throat> uh, Masaru and Barney came to us because our two component nanoparticle technology allows us to very easily make mosaic nanoparticles that co-display even oligomeric antigens. So the idea here is that if, if there are conserved epitopes on these various antigenically related proteins, only cross-reacted B cells will get the benefit of nanoparticle presentation, whereas B cells that are expressing strain-specific BCRs will not. And so this should tilt the balance in favor of those cross-reacted B cells and elicit broadly protective responses. So Dan Ellis, a grad student in my group, led this work designing and manufacturing these, these particles, displaying multiple different influenza hemagglutinin trimers. These are the four strains that are found in current seasonal vaccines. Characterization of particles showed that they came out as designed. And what we found was that the mosaic nanoparticles, as well as the corresponding cocktail particles separately displaying each A, both significantly improved protection against heterosubtypic challenge. So these are distant cousins on the flu family tree, things like H5N1, H7N9, compared to commercial vaccines. But the mosaics seem to have a subtle yet consistent edge over the cocktail in these challenge studies. We showed using polyclonal epitope mapping um, by EM that these heterosubtypic responses derive from antibodies that are targeting the conserved stem epitope in influenza hemagglutinin. And so that was consistent with the mosaic hypothesis and the way that we thought this might be working. And so of course, now we're building on that work in the coronavirus space and going back and designing mosaic nanoparticles for sarbicoviruses and beta coronaviruses to try and elicit similar protective breadth. So in a preliminary study that, that we recently published in collaboration with the Barrick Lab, we showed that a mosaic, two mosaic nanoparticles, one of which contains all four of these RBDs and one of which lacks the SARS-CoV RBD, both provide strong protection from SARS-CoV challenge in mice. So even when the SARS-CoV RBD is not in the vaccine, you get very good protection from challenge. So this is encouraging, um, but we're conducting second generation studies on, on newer designs to really see what the limits of that protective breadth are. So I won't walk you through the summary, but hopefully um, I've convinced you that computational design can be useful um, in the vaccine space. And just one thing I'd like to highlight is this is only the beginning. We've only scratched the surface of, of what we can do using computational design. And new methods and approaches are going to continue to open up new technology platforms uh, that, that could be useful in a number of different ways. So I wanted to highlight the people that did the work. Um, again, highly collaborative with a number of different groups. And of course, our funders. And, and thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions if we still have time. Thank you, Neil. Wonderful work. 
Uh, we do have time for questions and they've been coming in. Uh, I forgot to say at the beginning, if you do have a question, we're using the Q&A tab. And so please submit them through the Q&A tab and we'll take a few questions live after each talk. And if we don't get to all of your questions, we can uh, be uh, you know, uh, typing the responses to you afterwards. So uh, go ahead and use that Q&A uh, to do that. And maybe I'll start off before I get to the audience questions. Uh, you know, a question that I'm always asking you about in, in this kind of work is immunogenicity. And can you just mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the immunogenicity of the nanoparticles themselves? And is this actually a positive or a negative, you know, in the context of vaccination, both, you know, for a particular disease uh, and then in the context of future boosters or using the same platform for multiple different uh, viruses? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's a great question. We absolutely get immune responses against the nanoparticle scaffold. They're foreign proteins. They're in this symmetric array. And so we always measure those anti-scaffold responses and publish them. Do they matter? It's an open question. The studies that we've conducted to date suggest that they aren't, you know, significantly deleterious to the antigen specific response. We've done studies, for example, where we pre-immunize with just the nanoparticle scaffold with no antigen on it to elicit high levels of anti-scaffold antibodies. And then we come in and boost those animals with the antigen displaying nanoparticles. And we see no difference in the, the antigen specific response compared to animals that didn't receive the pre-immunization. So in that study, right, we haven't seen any deleterious effect. It's important to remember, you know, these things are not viral vector vaccines. In viral vector vaccines, you can get vector neutralizing antibodies that completely tank the vaccine. That's not the case here. The protein is the vaccine. So we're doing a lot of additional work. We're about to submit a manuscript on the interplay uh, between anti-scaffold and antigen specific responses, but more work needs to be done. Great, thank you. So I'll read a couple of the audience questions. Um, one question uh, I think has to do with you know, clearance of these particles. Um, how, do, how does nanoparticle interact with other proteins in the body? Does it disassemble in the end? Yeah, so we do know that it, <clears throat> at some point these are broken down. So we have measured T cell responses against the nanoparticle subunits and you get CD4 T cell responses against them exactly as you would expect. So these things are endocytosed processed and presented on class two. So the particles end up being broken down. They're entirely protein, of course. So we haven't measured this, but my assumption is, you know, in the end, they're broken down to amino acids and then your body makes new proteins out of them. There was another question uh, that I think you basically just answered about, uh, do the nanoparticles induce comparable T cell responses to the mRNA vaccines? So we, so these things, even though they're nanoparticles, they're still, you know, subunit vaccines, they're purified protein. And so we do get CD4 T cell responses, um, but we do not get significant CD8 T cell responses. And that's, again, is exactly as you would expect from a subunit vaccine. And I guess there's a couple of questions that basically relate to just, you know, comparing and contrasting the mRNA vaccines, you know, which have been pretty effective. Um, and just really getting at what is it about the nanoparticle vaccine that uh, is an improvement over those mRNA vaccines? What's the, the, you know, if you could summarize kind of what that difference is. Yeah, I think, you know, every platform has advantages and disadvantages. So I think, you know, the major advantage to mRNA is speed. I mean, you just cannot compare to the speed of mRNA. It's incredible. Um, but uh, currently, right, stability, and distribution of mRNA is, is maybe a little bit challenging having to ship the things frozen. Again, as you mentioned, we've done a fantastic job as a civilization of, of doing that. But if it could be easier, would we take that? Yes. Um, so I think the stability and scalability of the, of the protein nanoparticle is an advantage. Um, also currently, and I expect this to change in the future, you know, when, when you inject an mRNA vaccine, everything has to be autonomous. You don't have control over what's happening. Right, whereas when you're making a protein in a factory, you have control. So making things like these mosaic nanoparticles to provide breadth, very easy to do with protein right now, very difficult to do with mRNA. I expect that to change. And in fact, I mean, people are already, including us, are already starting to work on combining these. One of the advantages of using protein nanoparticles is they're fully genetically encoded. So there's no reason you can't launch these things via an mRNA. Thanks. Uh, Celia actually had a question uh, about glycosylation of the surface proteins and, you know, how do you handle, you know, that issue on these complex glycosylated 
uh, antigens? Yeah, so to date, everything we've done has been expression in, in human host, well, sorry, eukaryotic host cells, CHO for, you know, the commercial production, of course. Um, but we and others are exploring alternative expression hosts, you know, things like yeasts that might be uh, easier and lower cost in the future. But so far, everything's been human. We, we characterize the glycans that come out and they look just like you would expect. Great. So I think in the interest of time, we should probably uh, keep going, but uh, there are a few uh, other questions in the Q&A, if you wouldn't mind just taking a look at those and, and typing answers. Um, but thank you again for a really wonderful talk. Thank you. The Division of Structural Biology at Duke's Human Vaccine Institute, uh, as well as being an assist associate professor of surgery at the Duke School of Medicine. Uh, so let's uh, welcome Dr. Achara. Thanks, Michael. And and thank you very much for the for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here and to present some of our work. So uh, I'm, I'm a structural biologist and uh, I work at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute, which is an institute situated within Duke, Duke University. So this gives a little bit of, of background of where I, I come from. This Duke Human Vaccine Institute is a cool place to work because you can take your science right from very, very basic research to, cl to clinical trials. So it's all housed within the same, same institute. So this shows some of, some of that and uh, Duke, Duke Human Vaccine Institute, or in short, DHVI, it's it's involved in a lot of lot of viral research and uh, other pathogens, including new new pandemics such as the the COVID nineteen pandemic. My lab has uh, and I have been been interested in from many years in the structural biology of HIV one entry. That's what that's what we have been doing so far. And basically, we like to to gain basic understanding of the mechanism of how uh, HIV one enters cells, and then hope that from that basic understanding, we will get 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 knowledge which we can apply to vaccine design. It generally happens that way that the the basic science leads into the into the, into the translational science. And then when, when the, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, like many other labs, we tried to see what we could do to use our, our knowledge uh, to help in the, in the pandemic. So that's how uh, we, we got into it. And I, my, my talk is outlined in this way, how we started. I wanted to give, since this is a protein society meeting, I wanted to give an overview of how we transitioned from one protein to another. And uh, then I'd like to talk about some of our work on the spike evolution and uh, then hopefully end in a hopeful note that there are, in spite of all this evolution, there are invariant epitopes which give, give rise, which keep the hope of a pan, pan coronavirus vaccine alive, how we started. So as protein, protein biochemists, the first thing we do when we want to study a, a, a protein is purify it. So, so this in March, 2020 is our first, uh, First, first preparation of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein from plasmid that we obtained from Jason McClellan's lab. So this shows the SDS paid gel and the, and the gel filtration, not very high quality, but good enough to get us started at that time. Uh, one of the things, this is the negative stain electron microscope, my, uh, micrograph of the SARS-CoV-2 spike preparation that I showed in the previous slide. The one, one thing we, we noticed early on is our preparation didn't look so clean by NSEM. There was a lot of broken particles and these green circles show the intact spikes. That's how they look like. They look like a kite, uh, but then you have these squiggly particles, which is not what you want to see. Uh, but, but in spite of that, we were able to get a decent resolution NSEM re reconstruction and also a cryo-EM reconstruction. So as cryo-electron microscopies, this is not a, not a micrograph you'd like to see just because it is, you, you can hardly see any particles, even though whatever particles are there give you a decent, decent re, 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 reconstruction. Very early on, we, we found out the reason for this, that the spike ectodomain is cold sensitive. This is what Neil alluded to in his talk as well. What we found was when you have the freshly purified spike, it is intact, nice kite shaped particles. When you store it at four, four degrees for a week, which we often do, we don't even think about it. We purify your protein, put it in the fridge. It denatures and it gives this misshapen particles. And then you can 
uh, refold them back. You can you can put it back at 37 for three hours and it, it goes back to these, these nice particles. So the data shown here is summarized in this in this bar graph. So once we found that out, that's that basically set us moving because then we could go from these bad micrographs, cryo-electron micrographs shown here on the right, to these nice ones where you see these little black splotches, which are your particles. And that allowed us to really move, move forward with our high resolution structural biology, because we could get many, many more particles for uh, the same amount of time of, of data collection. So this is uh, the our biochemistry team and our NSEM team who were really, really instrumental in this effort. This was just before Duke went into shutdown and uh, we kind of changed how, how we worked. Uh, so then we, we started studying the, the, the structural biology of the SARS-CoV-2 spy. So my lab is, uh, our fundamental interest is in understanding basic, basic biology and, and mechanism. Uh, but as we are in a vaccine vaccine institute, our 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 basic science studies very often translate and cross over into into immunogen design, which is exactly how we approach the SARS-CoV-2 spike uh, spike structural biology. Uh, so the the first thing we we wanted to do to understand the spike is control it. And so if you can understand a molecule well enough and to to control it the way you want that means you kind of really understand the, the, the molecule. So what we did with the, with the spike is we designed mutations that would either lock the spike down into an all down conformation where all the RBDs would be down like here, or it would uh, bring the spike up into an up conformation where you you would have had the had more up forms. And we were able to achieve that to through two through two sets of, of, of mutations, one which was known as RS2D, which brought all the all the RBDs down and they stayed down, whereas another one which uh, gave more up up conformations. So this is 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 published in NSMB. So and uh, just just to point out, two other groups around the same time also published this all down down conformation through similar sets of mutations. So this work was done in, in collaboration with Rory, Rory Henderson at Duke, Duke University. So one of the fun, one of the things we did in this, this study is we were we were starting out to understand a new protein. So how do you understand a new 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 protein quickly enough so that your work is relevant? So what he what what Rory did, he, he's a he's a computational biologist. What what Rory did is he condensed, he simplified the spike protein into a set of vectors and scalars. And uh, now we had little domains instead of this complex protein molecule, we had these little domains and uh, connected by dihedrals and vectors. And we understood how they moved. And from there, uh, we understood how we could control them. And then from there, around that time, when we were finishing off that, that work, we the spike started evolving. This is an, an image I took off Twitter. Uh, so what it what this shows is uh, the ancestral virus very, very early on, it, it, it mutated to what we know as the D614G mutation. And from there it took off. And now there are five variants of, of concern, um, including the Omicron, which just, just started appearing. Uh, so we started, started looking at, by then we had optimized our methods for looking at the structures of the spike. So we, we started um, looking at variations in the spike that were evolving. So Omicron, of course, is, uh, is a big concern just because it has many, many, many mutations, and especially in the antibody uh, epitopes. Uh, but it all started with the D614G gene mutation. So this mutation took over uh, almost, uh, it, it took over the, the, the world. Now it has replaced the original Wuhan statement. And it was first, first pointed out in this, in this paper by, by Betty Corber and David, David Montefiore. So Sophie Cobell, a, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, she started looking at the, at the mutations, uh, the D614G, and this is, is published in Cell Reports. And this figure summarizes what we found in the paper, that the D614G mutation leads to more RBD up confirmation, which probably makes it easier for the, for the virus to transmit. 
and we also found that it leads to more furin cleavage. So these were the, were, the, were the findings of the paper and other people have also found this, that the D614 G, G mutation leads to more, more up confirmation. So from then on, uh, we started looking at other variations because they kept coming. Um, and this is a paper published in Science with, with Sophie Gobel again as the lead author, where we, we, we looked at a spike which was from a virus which was involved in transmission from humans to minks. And then this is the alpha variant and, and the beta beta variant. So in all, in all of these, I, I pointed out, uh, like in, in the alpha variant, you have a P681H mutation, which is really near the furin cleavage site. So there is a continued interest in uh, the furin cleavage site due to the, the mutations accumulating around it. So in all of our work, we closely coupled our structural studies with, with binding data. We had a, a panel of antibodies that we had, had structurally, st structurally characterized, which bound to various uh, epitopes on the RBD and the NTD. And this is data shown here. So the summary of the, of the data is there are some antibodies like DH1047, 10, which I will talk about later, which are pretty invariant from, you know, they are not affected by any of the, of the variants studied so far. And whereas some entity directed antibodies are, are affected by, by variations, as are some, some other RBD directed antibodies. So some, a su summary, a snapshot of the, of the data was we found as expected probably that the mink associated spikes do not show any signs of immune evasion because they didn't probably have to face an immune system and evolve. Whereas the alpha spike shows much lower binding to NTD directed antibody. So what all this shows is all of our structural data, which is on a spike vector domain, which you could call is an artificial construct. It translates and it equates very well with what, what people are observing in the, in, in the context of the real virus in the real, 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 real virology assays. So then we started understanding how, what are the differences? What, how is the spike evolving? And what, what, is, what is going on at, at the atomic level? So for example, for the mink spike, we found that the, the mink spike shows signs of instability. So by, by comparison with, uh, by carefully, carefully parsing out the heterogeneity in the structure, we found that the mink spike was really, really unstable to the extent that it lost almost one of its protomers. And we hypothesized from that observation that uh, that probably is why the mink spike did not take off. Uh, and through atomic levels structural determination, we could pinpoint which residues, which of the, of the mutations were responsible for every, every phenotype. For example, in the mink spike, we implicated the I692 to valine mutation as the reason for its instability. In the alpha spike, where it was, it had to face an immune system where we found that the spike had pretty cleverly evolved to balance stabilizing and destabilizing mutations. An example is shown here. Uh, we have a loss of a hydrogen bond here uh, in, in, in the alpha variant compared to the D614G variant. Uh, but really right close to it, you have a, 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 sta a, sta a, sta a stabilizing interaction. So we feel that the alpha and the, the variants that are emerging, they are striking a balance between making the spike more readily transmissible or making the virus more readily transmissible and keeping the spike structure intact. And this is yet another example. This is also part of the science paper, so I will not go into the details. What this shows is when the, the alpha variant lost a bond in, in order to be more open or more in the, in the up state, so it could bind more ACE2 receptor, it gained an, an interaction around the same area, so it wouldn't cause the spike to fall apart. So we learned a lot from seeing how the spike evolves and how to, to incorporate these ideas into our designs. So I will sw switch gear a little bit and talk about now that we had this nice uh, uh, tools, our structural biology tools are well, well developed. We, st we started uh, uh, collaborating with our, with our colleagues in the DHVI because they, they were isolating antibodies from, from convalescent individuals. And we started studying these antibodies. So that formed the 
epitope mapping bin in our in our thinking and we solve this the, the, the structures of some of these antibodies and you have seen that earlier this also helped our ba our basic science so this paper is is published in cell so then i'm going to switch to the invariant epitope so what is the good news from all of this uh, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll start with an with an antibody called DH 1047. So it binds the RBD. It is this uh, purple pink antibody shown here, and it. Uh, so we we are moving really fast. So we this is a three and a half angstrom cryo EM structure, and some some of you may know because the RBD moves so much, it's really hard to get high resolution details there. But the details in our structure were enough to trace the main chain pretty accurately. Uh, and we could quickly complement it with other assays, for example, binding assays through, through alanine scanning mutagenesis. So we could uh, validate all of, our, all of our structural contacts. Uh, so, that, so that way we made use of the, uh, of the, of the structural data complemented with other data to move forward at a, at a rapid pace. So the, the good thing about DH1047 is it neutralizes all the variants known so far. Uh, and we don't yet have, have, have data on Omicron, but we should have it soon. Uh, and it, uh, it binds to an epitope, which is very, very conserved in cervical viruses. That's why it neutralizes. In collaboration with our, our, our colleagues at UNC, uh, we saw that it, it is a pr pretty, uh, pretty, uh, effective uh, prophylactic and, and therapeutic agent. Uh, so this is the, is the epitope, it binds. So, uh, so this slide kind of conveys that the RBD is completely covered. You have, it's a highly immunodominant um, part of the uh, spike and you, it's, it's completely covered with uh, antibodies. And uh, there was there there were two big 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 studies which which classified all these antibodies, uh, one from from Bjorkman group, Pamela Bjorkman's, and one from Erica Allman Sapphire's group. So here is DH1047 compared to all the well-known other antibodies, and it's pretty pretty interesting that the DH1047 binding site it really closely uh, interfaces with some of the binding of very potent nanobodies. So this is a recurrently occurring site, which is highly conserved, which is invariant. It is not susceptible to any of, of the variation we have seen, seen so far. And so a pretty hopeful um, antibody. So that's, that's, the, that's the binding site compared to other uh, known antibodies. Then there is another antibody which is different, which is different because its, it's binding footprint comes really close to the sites of variation. So I'm seeing, I'm showing three of the, of the variations here, E484K and 5019 and K417N. So, so in spite of it binding right next to the, the, the variation, it, it has found a way to avoid the, the, the variation and still be very effective against all, all variants known so far. This, this also is being, being tested currently against Omicron. So these two antibodies, so this, uh, this antibody 1284, it binds uh, in the RBM, in the, in the receptor bindings, uh, binding motif, which is actually pretty, pretty, pretty susceptible to variation. A lot of variation happens there, but this antibody is able to over override that and still be able to be, be, be effective. Next is uh, on the same theme of invariance. One of the things which is, which is common about coronaviruses and, and HIV is are their glycan shields. They are all heavily, heavily glycosylated uh, pathogens. So uh, in 2021, not very, very, very long back, we discovered antibodies which bind glycans, which, which specifically bind, bind, bind glycans. So these are pretty unique antibodies. Generally, antibodies are Y-shaped like this, but these antibodies are I-shaped. So the two fab arms, they join together to form a combined uh, binding surface, which allows weak, uh, which allows weak glycan in, in interactions to come together to form a, a strong interaction due to avidity. 
So what we found is, so long, uh, from a long, long time back, uh, we knew of this antibody called 2G12, which binds to the gly glycan shield of HIV-1. It binds four glycans as shown here. Uh, we found that this antibody also binds uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein as shown here. It binds to a three glycan cluster in the S2 subunit. So this is, uh, is published in, in cell as well. Uh, so that was, that was interesting because then we thought that this could be a, a target. So we know that to, that, to, that, to, that 2G12 doesn't neutralize SARS-CoV-2, but it is an antibody which is evolved against the, the HIV-1 one glycan shield. So whether similar antibodies can evolve against the SARS-CoV-2 glycan shield is an open question. And at DHVI, we are looking for those, those kinds of antibodies. So this, from, from the protein science, science point of view, the, the binding of 2G12 is to SARS-CoV-2 spike is pretty interesting because it's confirmation specific. The three glycans come from different prodromers. So they have to be in a, in a particular orientation uh, for 2G12 to bind effectively. So we have been using it as a tool to look at uh, changes in conformation in that region. So you can see variation in 2G12 binding due to either furin cleavage or due to, due to temperature. I'll, I'll summarize what I have I've I've, I've told you so far. One is, you know, we are, we are looking at, at viral evolution, specifically of the spike. And then I have also told you about sites that are invariant, uh, antibodies that, that bind irrespective of, of the variation in the spike known so far. Uh, I talked about two RBD-directed antibodies. And then I talked about the glycan epitope, which is still under investigation as, as to its utility in, in protection. Another study I haven't, I haven't talked about here is a fusion peptide epitope. So S2 subunit epitopes are of really high interest uh, because they are not, so, not, not neutralizing epitopes, but they may have other protective functions. One of them is the fusion peptide, high, highly conserved. So here I'm showing an, an, an antibody called DH1058, which binds, this is a crystal structure, which binds the binds the fusion peptide, probably in an alternate conformation of the spike. So these are all the epitopes which are not, not affected by spike variation so far. So with that, I wanted to thank my lab and it's evolving as well uh, since the pre-pandemic and the pandemic days and our collaborators and funders. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Priyambada. So we're open for questions. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start off before getting the audience questions. Um, this cold denaturation you know, phenotype is really interesting. Do you, do you have any insight mechanistically into what's causing that? And you know, can you predict you know, which uh, envelope constructs uh, or spike constructs are going to be susceptible? Yes, so we did show in the, in the paper that if you have interprotomer stabilizing mutations, they are not cold sensitive. So we think that it's is the is the protomers for, for falling falling apart. And because the the reason they fall back is because they are held together by a by a fold on motif. So though they come apart, they cannot just uh, just 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 completely denature. Uh, but uh, in terms of which regions are, are important, we are investigating that now. We have some hypothesis. We think that the region near the SD2 uh, subunit subdomain might be important. There might be some relation to pH sensitivity because the, the spike conformation is also pH sensitive. So we are investigating the crosstalk between pH sensitivity and, and cold sensitivity. We, are, we think they are, they are interrelated. Thank you. Uh, from the audience, uh, we've got a question. Did you use the two proline mutant spike? This no, very early, early on. on. Yeah. yeah, very so very uh, very early on, we we moved away from the two P because we thought that the two P is a, is a stabilizing mutation. We didn't since we were doing 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 mechanistic studies, uh, we we wanted to not have 
the 2P context. And su surprisingly, we found that without the 2P, our, our construct expressed and behaved well, which is a, was a surprise at that time because the MERS construct, which was done, done previously, did not, uh, they, they needed to add the 2P to, to have it well behaved. But in our hands, they behave similarly. Uh, so we use the non 2P version of the ecto domain. Thanks. A uh, question about cold denaturation. It's reported that the D614G uh, desensitizes to cold denaturation. How does this match to more RBD up in that mutant? So I think they are two different. So D, D614G, the RBD up phenotype, we think it's it's because it loses an interaction as Hallbridge. And uh, we have found e even with other variations, including the ones we have made, we have designed that if you lose any interactions between the SD2 subdomain or even the SD1 sub 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 subdomain and the neighboring areas, it leads to more up conformation. Uh, but the but the cold sensitivity may not be completely related to that, but it could be coming from the same mutation. So D614G is a change in the um, in uh, charge. In, 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 an, in an area that we think is, is related to cold sensitivity. We are still investigating those. Uh, so I don't have a clear answer, but I think uh, the charge of the, the chart change might have something to do with why D614G is desensitized to cold sensitivity. Did you observe post fusion structures? Su surprisingly, not. You know, we when when we re when we reverted the two P, we were we were expecting a lot of uh, post fusion structures, uh, but uh, and very little yield. But we were surprised that you know it didn't happen. It was all pre fusion. But some of the some of the of variants, and especially when we make furin cleaved versions, we are observing some post fusion structure, but not that much. Mike, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. So, um, so I was really surprised when Omicron came out that you know we had some early variants that were a few few changes away from the original wild type, so to speak, and now all of a sudden something appears that's thirty mutations away, and that suggests there must be gazillion variants out there among us. It's just only like one person has that variant. If, if you took like two people that both have Delta right now in America, and you actually sequence the viruses, would they actually be the same or would they actually be variants of Delta? So I think there will be evolution within an individual. So now in this, in this case, or Omicron, it is evolved within an, it is thought to have evolved within a HIV-1, an immunocompromised HIV-1 individual. And uh, this person was, 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 was positive for the virus for many months. So generally, people clear the virus before there is a, a lot of evolution within that one individual. But in this case, uh, the, the virus was able to mutate against a weaker immune pressure for many months. I think it was almost a year. That's, uh, that's the current... Uh, Current information, so that that gave rise to all these mutations. Oh, thank you. That's very interesting. All right, thanks very much. There's a couple more questions, if you wouldn't mind answering them uh, via via text uh, chat. Uh, but thank you very much. Great talk. Okay, so we're ready for our fourth and final uh, talk. And so, Stephen, if you want to load up your slides, I'll briefly introduce you. And you're muted as well. All right, so our final speaker uh, for today is Dr. Stephen Goldstein. Uh, he is a NIH F32 postdoctoral fellow in Nell's Eldie's lab uh, at the Department of Human Genetics at the University of Utah uh, School of Medicine. Uh, and so welcome, look forward to hearing about or about evolution of the spike protein. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for the invitation to present. So yeah, I'll talk about evolution of the spike protein, the evolutionary signals we see and some of the phenotypic consequences of the evolution that we've been seeing um, throughout the pandemic. So this is familiar, obviously, from the last talk. It's the spike trimer, which is divided into two, each trimer is divided into two major domains. So S1, which is the globular head domain and contains the RBD, and S2, which is the stock domain that contains uh, the fusion machinery and critically, 
at the boundary of those two domains is the furin cleavage site that was mentioned. Um, and cleavage occurs there, which is necessary for uh, activating the fusion machinery. And, uh, and there's been, there's a strong evolutionary signal around that site that I'll talk about. And so going back to the very beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 story, um, this is from David Wiesler's lab, showing that SARS-CoV-2 uses the same ACE2 receptor as uh, the first SARS coronavirus. And so the critical experiment here is in BHK cells, which don't express ACE2 and are refractory to SARS-CoV-2 uh, pseudotype transduction. And then when ACE2 is expressed, uh, SARS-CoV-2 enters these cells quite readily. And then panel D is relevant also because um, that goes to the point of the furin cleavage site. The upper band is full length spike and then the lower band is uh, cleaved S2 domain. And you can see in SARS-CoV-1 all the way on the left, spike is mostly uncleaved. In SARS-CoV-2, spike is almost entirely cleaved uh, at that furin cleavage site. And then when the furin site is mutated, um, it remains uncleaved. And so it's interesting that SARS-CoV-2 binds the, the same human ACE2 receptor because at six of the critical contact residues with ACE2, SARS-CoV-2 uh, differs from SARS-CoV-1. So this is a, just an amino acid alignment with SARS-CoV-2 on the top and SARS-1 on the bottom. And the only site they share among these six residues is Y505. Uh, and despite this, SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2 with very high affinity, a little bit higher than SARS-1 in most studies that have looked at this, showing the evolutionary plasticity of this receptor binding domain, its ability to tolerate uh, many mutations and still bind uh, ACE2 with high affinity, which becomes important in terms of the evolution of different variants of concern. And so one of the first evolutionary studies that was done came from Jesse Bloom's lab, <clears throat> where they did deep mutational scanning of the spike uh, using a yeast display system mutating every possible residue in, residue in the spike receptor binding domain uh, to every other possible amino acid at that site, and then looking at how that affects uh, affinity of ACE2. And so the first thing that jumps out is there's a lot of red, and those are mutations that are deleterious to ACE2 affinity. And then white are mutations that have minimal impact, and then in blue are the mutations that increase affinity. So there are a few of those, and this is complicated because epistatic interactions, as we're discovering, can affect the behavior of individual mutations as well. But one of the mutations that really popped out of this, uh, these experiments was position 501, and specifically an N501Y mutation that increases affinity for ACE2. And that's a particularly interesting mutation because it subsequently um, became clear that this site was a major signal of convergent evolution among variants of concern. So uh, I'll start most of the talk looking at say alpha through delta, and then I'll turn to Omicron um, later in the talk. But what's been really interesting about the different variants of concern is signals of convergent evolution that we're seeing. So three major sites where we've seen this occur. So one is the N-terminal domain of the spike where um, we've seen deletions uh, similar deletions in multiple of the variants of concern, and that's a major antigenic site. The other, another is the receptor binding domain, where th the first three major variants of concern to appear, alpha, beta, and gamma, all had that N501Y mutation that was pre essentially predicted by the deep mutational scanning approach from the Bloom lab. And then another site of convergent evolution is position 484, which appeared in beta and gamma, and 417. Uh, mutations at that site as well, and uh, also appeared on some alpha sublineages. The third major site of convergent evolution that we're seeing is adjacent to the furin site. So the last talk mentioned the P681H mutation in alpha that's believed to improve furin cleavage, and delta has a very similar mutation, P681R, also making this site more basic, uh, which improves furin cleavage. And uh, both of these are associated with the increased transmissibility of alpha and then delta uh, as well. And so we can actually then, um, there's been some really nice experimental work taking these signals of convergent evolution and some of these mutations at the furin cleavage site and connecting them directly to um, the fitness advantages that I'll discuss later. But first, 
Turning to kind of the evolutionary landscape of the pandemic, um, this is a phylogenetic tree from NextStrain, which samples 4,000 genomes a day across everything that's been sequenced throughout the pandemic, and looking at essentially the rise and fall of different variants of concern. So if you look back to fall, last fall and winter, what you see is uh, the predominant variant of concern being alpha in the dark blue. Um, and we really thought alpha, this is a really fit virus. This is a, a really um, highly transmissible virus and it could predominate for a long time. And it did cause a significant wave in many parts of the world, kind of co-occurring with beta and gamma, um, which I'll show had dominance in different parts of the world. But then all of a sudden this past summer, Delta comes to predominate uh, the global epidemic. And that's the green and light blue sequences at the top that by this summer, in most parts of the world, all we're seeing is Delta. And that's true in the United States, continues to be true in the United States and most of the world. Um, but what we're see starting to, seeing to start to pop up now, of course, is Omicron, which is that very long branch uh, in red towards the bottom. And I think, you know, uh, towards the end of the last talk, talked about selection for some of these evolution and selection of some of these variants in immunocompromised individuals, possibly HIV po uh, positive individuals. And that probably accounts for much of that very long branch length that we see uh, with Omicron. And we saw something similar with Alpha as well, actually. So looking at the rise and fall of these different variants um, in different parts of the world, we see in the United States in dark red, there was a large Alpha wave that reached about 70% of the sequences we saw in the United, and, and with, but was very quickly displaced by Delta in green uh, over this summer. We saw something similar in the United Kingdom where Alpha actually reached just about 100% of sequences before its displacement by Delta, but a pretty different picture in other parts of the world. So uh, in South Africa in bright red, they had a very large uh, beta wave. Alpha was not really a major player there, then displaced by Delta, which now seems to be getting displaced by Omicron in purple. In contrast, in South America, the example I'll use here is Brazil in pink, a very large gamma wave before being displaced by Delta uh, also this summer. And what drives the rise and fall of these variants essentially is uh, changes in the r naught or the intrinsic transmissibility, or at least that's been the case so far. And so what we see here is the change relative to ancestral Wuhan strain, where alpha, beta, and gamma all had um, modest transmissibility advantages. This data is a little noisy. If you ask me, I'd actually say that alpha was more transmissible than beta and gamma. But what really sticks out here is the huge leap um, that Delta made over prior variants of concern with an r naught at least twice as high as the ancestral uh, Wuhan strain and uh, considerably higher than prior variants of concern. So when you see this data, um, estimated for multiple epidemiological studies, it becomes very clear why, uh, at an epi level, why Delta displaced the prior variants of concern. Uh, lost my... But we can also look at a molecular level. And so doing direct competition studies in the lab and actually honing in on specific mutations, specific evolutionary changes that underlie these fitness advantages that different variants have. So this comes from UTMB. And this is doing direct competition studies, inoculating hamsters on the left intranasally at a one-to-one -one ratio with Delta and Alpha virus, and then sequencing uh, nasal washes of those hamsters at days one through five and seeing if one of the variants comes to predominate over the other. And that's exactly what they saw with Delta um, by day one already has almost a two to one advantage over Alpha increasing to threefold um, by the end of the experiment. Ma and then mapping that directly to that P681R mutation. So when they make a Delta virus where the R is reverted back to a P at 681 adjacent to that furin site, the competitive adv advantage over Alpha is uh, completely gone. Uh, and in fact, Alpha outcompetes Delta Notably, alpha still has a furin site mutation there, delta doesn't. So while the RBD mutations are probably important both for transmissibility and certainly as I'll show for immune escape, these furin site mutations are actually a huge contributor to the increases in transmissibility of the variants of concern and something that we actually probably understand a bit less than the impact of uh, RBD mutations. And so I'll, I'll 
turn to Omicron now and why we're concerned. Um, this is data from South Africa, from the South African government and looking at the course of the epidemic there. They had a early uh, winter spring wave like much of the world, not typified by any particular variant of concern. Then a large beta wave, uh, a large delta wave, which had subsided uh, late this fall and then a very sudden rise associated with the appearance of Omicron uh, exceeding the magnitude of their previous waves. Uh, in South Africa. And so what's going on with Omicron? So this is um, mapping different mutations onto the spike structure from beta, delta, and then Omicron. And so the RBD is at the top and beta was really defined by these three mutations at 417, 484, and 501, but no furin site mutation. Uh, delta in contrast only has two RBD mutations at positions 478 and 452, which are only associated with a modest amount of immune escape, but has that, uh, and no major changes in affinity for ACE2, but has the furin site mutation at uh, position 681 that's clearly associated with a large fitness advantage. Omicron is a totally different beast. It has over 30 spike mutations, 15 in the RBD, uh, position 501, also 484, uh, also 417 and 478. So many of the mutations that we saw in prior variants of concern it has that furin site mutation of P681H and uh, a host of other RBD mutations um, that are particularly important position 446, as we'll see being one of them. And so unfortunately, what that means is that Omicron has mutations in all three major RBD epitopes. So there are basically three classes of antibodies that target the receptor binding domain and major escape sites for binding of those are positions 417, 484 and 446, and Omicron has mutations uh, has mutations at all three of those sites in addition to many others. And so this is data that comes from a, an RBD, a mutation escape calculator that was just produced by the Bloom Lab, a really useful guide for looking at how per, uh, individual or sets of mutations affect antibody binding. And so this is based on a pool of 33 characterized monoclonal antibodies. And when you mutate sites 417, 446, and 484, as you can see at the bottom, you're predicted to escape from 70% uh, of the antibodies in that pool, kind of simulating a polyclonal response. And that's not the whole picture with Omicron. When you mutate the full set of RBD mutations in Omicron, now you're projected to escape from 80% of those antibodies, uh, raising concerns immediately, even before we had uh, neutralization data that I will show now that it's kind of flooding in, um, that Omicron would uh, show significant escape from antibody binding. And how does that compare with predictions from other variants of concern? So I mentioned alpha and delta, pretty modest amounts of antibody escape. Their uh, increased transmissibility throughout the population largely linked to an inherent increase in transmissibility rather than the ability to escape either uh, infection from um, immunity from prior infection or immunization. Beta and gamma showed uh, somewhat more immune antibody escape properties than alpha or delta, but Omicron, as I mentioned, predicted to escape up to 80% of antibody binding, similar to a, a engineered polymutant spike from Paul Binash's lab um, that was engineered to escape most antibody binding. And Omicron, unfortunately, looks uh, quite a bit like that. And so very recently, we've had a flood just in the last two or three days of uh, neutralization data coming from Omicron. So the first was from Alex Siegel's group in South Africa that looked at um, double vaccinees, uh, double vaccinees with the Pfizer vaccine in orange, and then people who had been infected and then vaccinated in green and saw a 40-fold drop in neutralization of Omicron compared to the D614G variant that was mentioned in the last talk. Almost a complete loss of neutralization, frankly, in people who are double vaccinated. Fortunately, um, people who had been infected prior to the vaccination, although they still experienced the similar magnitude drop, did retain neutralization activity against Omicron. And this was done with live virus. Pfizer then released some of its own data using pseudovirus. Uh, and saw similarly from double vaccinees, essentially a complete loss of neutralization against Omicron, uh, substantially restored, however, by a third dose of the vaccine. And so 
uh, that's promising and also certainly argues for the urgency of getting boosters into people's arms with Omicron knocking on the doorstep. Another group in Frankfurt then released uh, similar data looking at uh, double vaccinees and then um, people who had been boosted and they saw similarly double vaccinees, a complete loss of neutralization with a third dose, uh, some restoration of uh, neutralization of Omicron, still a 20 to 40 fold drop, but some retention of neutralization. And then most recently we had a really nice study come out of Innsbruck. This came out late yesterday uh, looking at uh, neutralization from serum from people who had been vaccinated with several of the major vaccines, as well as uh, convalescent serum from people infected previously with alpha, beta, or delta. So this becomes really important because there are places in the world with low vaccination coverage, but that experience very significant waves from one or more of these variants, South Africa being one of them, having had a large beta and delta wave. So starting with the vaccine serum at the top, spike vax is Moderna, uh, Chadox is the AstraZeneca vaccine, and then BNT162B2 is Pfizer. And what we see is a substantial, uh, in some cases, complete loss of neutralization against Omicron, which is all the way on the right, uh, from people who have been vaccinated with these, um, some retention with people who got the AstraZeneca and then uh, Pfizer or double Pfizer. Uh, doses of vaccines, but um, still in their range of the 20 to 40 fold loss of neutralization. And particularly alarming for um, parts of the world that have had low vaccine coverage, but significant uh, prior infection is that infection with um, either alpha, beta, or delta uh, seem to provide a complete loss of neutralization. Uh, when Omicron is on the table. And that unfortunately is consistent with the epidemiological data from South Africa, where the vaccination rate is relatively low, but the convalescent rate from the prior waves is very high, perhaps 80% or more. Despite that, we're seeing that very rapid rise uh, in the Omicron case count and likely comes down to what we're seeing with the um, complete loss of neutralization from prior infection, from infection with prior variants. The upside, is that people who had been infected, infected and then vaccinated or vaccinated and subsequently had a breakthrough infection retained substantial neutralization against Omicron. So the hope um, is that the large percentage of the population in some countries who fall into that population will retain um, some protection against Omicron and also the hope that booster doses uh, may recapitulate some of that retained protection against Omicron that's evident in these so-called super immune or hybrid immunity uh, individuals. And so for my acknowledgments, I just want to thank um, GISAID, the database where um, uh, all of these sequences that make all of this work possible for the entire world are deposited. And then scientists in Botswana and South Africa, who were the first to alert the world uh, both to the beta variant and now to the Omicron variant uh, in particular, which have enabled just in the last two weeks, multiple groups around the world to start producing data on what kind of protection we might expect with vaccines against this variant. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Sure. Very interesting. Uh, maybe I'll start off the questioning. Um, so uh, I guess um, probably like many people, I was expecting Delta Plus to be the next you know, variant of concern. And um, I'm just curious, uh, is there any sign of that happening given you know, how many experiments are happening in hundreds of millions of people you know, with this dominant Delta strain? Yeah, so there's, there's one sublineage of Delta called AY4, which some data from the UK suggested might have a small transmission advantage over the parental Delta strain. I also expected some kind of Delta plus to appear, um, but we haven't seen a Delta, we've seen Delta lineages pick up, say, a 484 mutation um, or a 501Y mutation, but they haven't seemed to take off. So there may be some epistatic reasons why those combinations don't work as well with um, the Delta spike as we might have expected, or just that uh, Omicron appeared before one of these Delta plus lineages could really acquire the mutations on its own to take off. You know, there's still tons of Delta circulation going on in the world. So we may still see some sub lineage of Delta pop up 
that shows more substantial immune escape or another leap in transmissibility over the next couple of months. You know, I'm also curious about, you know, the furin site cleavage as a mechanism for improving, you know, spread or fitness. Yeah. What's distinctive about that in humans versus, you know, animal reservoirs where these viruses, you know, originally came from? Um, you, you would just simplistically think that the furin cleavage might be something that would get optimized, you know, pretty early in evolution of the virus and that wouldn't be different in different hosts. Uh, I guess, can you comment about, about that? Why is that an opportunity for evolution in humans that didn't happen you know, earlier in animal hosts? Yeah, so one thing that's notable is the in the natural reservoir of these viruses, which are horseshoe bats, the infections are mostly enteric and that um, switches in uh, humans, but also other animals like small carnivores. So mink, for example, raccoon dogs, civets to uh, more infection in the respiratory tract. And I think there's some evidence from other viruses, other coronaviruses, that infection, um, that respiratory infection, at least in beta coronaviruses, is associated with furin cleavage sites. So two of the, the two human common cold beta coronaviruses, OC43 and HKU1, both have really good furin cleavage sites. The SARS-CoV-2 furin cleavage site is suboptimal. And so that's probably why we're continuing to see uh, evolution of that site as further adaptation into humans and associated with increased transmissibility. Thanks. Uh, I've got an audience question uh, that I think a lot of people are probably thinking about. Is there a possibility that Omicron was engineered in the lab? I know this sounds like a sci-fi idea, but it has so many mutations appearing at once. Yeah, so, you know, I think that that's very unlikely. Um, Part of the reason is, you know, some of one reason that we can talk about is that there seems to be a significant amount of positive epistasis going on with Omicron that you really is completely unpredictable. So if you look at the deep mutational scanning map from Jesse Bloom's lab and you actually look at particular mutations in Omicron, several of those are predicted to actually decrease affinity for ACE2. And you'd probably expect that if you were predicting uh, to decrease transmissibility and decrease fitness of the virus. The only reason they probably uh, are selected for the way they are is because there are other compensatory mutations in Omicron that maintain high affinity for ACE2 and maintain the transmissibility of this virus. But you really can't predict that kind of positive epistasis in the lab. If you were rationally designing a high fitness spike, you'd probably look at a combination of the deep mutational scanning for affinity, and then there's similar data for antibody escape. So you'd probably pick like N501Y and maybe a couple other mutations and then like three key immune escape mutations. You really wouldn't, I don't think there's any rational basis to choose mutations that decrease affinity for ACE2 in isolation and engineer that into a spike. So I think the possibility that this evolved in a, a chronically infected person, probably able to mount some kind of uh, antibody response, but not sufficient to clear the virus, maybe treated with monoclonal antibodies at some point, is a much stronger hypothesis for the origin of this variant. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think we've arrived at the end. Um, I just want to thank uh, all four speakers again for uh, wide ranging, very stimulating, and informative talks. I uh, really appreciate you joining us today. So, thank you again. And uh, thank you everybody for, for attending. Um, I'll just mention again that uh, the Protein Society has been doing quite an impressive series of webinars uh, uh, since the pandemic started. And so you can actually look at many of these at the Protein Society website if you'd like to catch up on the other uh, topics as well. So I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, any party comments for us, Chuck? No, but th thanks so much. I know everyone's really busy. I just really appreciate you taking the time to give these talks today. So, and thank you for everyone for attending. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure. Yeah. It, was, thank it went very well, I think.